Good morning to all. I would like to ask everybody to have a seat on their seats as we are about to start our day two. Uh, before we uh, actually start with the day two and the first panel of the this day, I would like you just to briefly to sum up what we did yesterday. Yesterday, we had very productive discussions uh, with uh, 16 speakers and moderators uh, opened the dialogue and 17 interventions for the floor, in which if we would like to kind of make a small sum up, uh, we actually under, underscore and try to underline that assess to the scale of current forecast climate induced displacement is one of the key things to really to see what is the real number. But not only what is the real number, as we said, one is assessing another one to, uh, to support and help the people that are in need and which were the most vulnerable. We noted partic particularly those most affected have already been vulnerable and alerted to consequences of failing to take adequate actions. Basically, it's just a call for a quick actions of all of us. The second, all panelists and intervenes agreed that there is a need to intensi intensify efforts to addressing the root causes of displacement. And more than ever, we need to talk about land and water degradation and how we can actually avoid further culmination of the shock factors, disruptions of the food supplies and economic impacts of post-COVID-19. This is just additional drivers to the mobility. It's also recognized the importance of dialogue among the member states, and this is one of the reasons why we're here, but more important, called on a broadened partnership with the private sector and donors on the way to COP27 to bridge the funding gap. We are also welcome the initiative aiming to improve the capacity for monitoring, forecasting, and early warning, and something that definitely needs to be considered at the COP27. Also, Something that is a underlined as a need is a sharing of best practice in reducing immediate and long-term vulnerabilities and identify benefits of greater involvement of women and youth in the planning, implementation, monitoring, and implementing the climate action. This is just in brief that what we yesterday discussed and we, we are also wishing today to have a equally fruitful discussions. Now I would like to give the floor to our moderator of the first session, our colleague, Cecile. Cecile, please. Good morning, warm welcome from my side. Um, so I'm Cecile Vialon, I'm the director at Intern of the Department of Peace and Development Coordination at IOM. And as you can see, I will be moderating uh, this session from, uh, from Brussels, from my regional office in Brussels. So it's a really warm welcome from my side for both, of course, the, uh, the participants in the room in Geneva and all the participants online. Um, so my, it's, uh, I will be moderating this first panel that is uh, dedicated to building resilient and adaptive migration pathways to contribute to food security and promote regular migration in the context of climate change. So we will have the immense pleasure of listening to our three panelists before we turn to the audience for questions and answers. Um, but before I turn to our panelists, to our speakers, I would like to provide some framing uh, remarks. So, opening safe and accessible migration routes for climate affected migrants is an increasingly important tool for tackling humanitarian as well as developmental crisis due to climate change and food insecurity. Environmental and climatic dynamics and their impacts on the habitability of different ecosystems and the viability of people's livelihoods with the critical issue of access to water for agricultural activities will increasingly have profound impacts on all patterns of population mobility. COVID-19 provided us with a dramatic example of a dynamic affecting mobility patterns at global and local levels and the vulnerability this has created for migrants and fam families and their communities. So in the context of global warming, there are already areas and regions that are facing the limits of adaptation. It is therefore urgent to address existing policy gaps related to admission and stay, and to design long-term and permanent solutions for people unable to adapt or return to their countries of origin. 
With the objective five of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, we have an increasing, incredibly useful entry point. As this calls to, and I quote, cooperate to develop and strengthen solutions for migrants compelled to leave their countries of origin because of the adverse drivers of climate change, including by devising planned relocation and visa options in cases where adaptation in or return to their country of origin is not possible. So this is an incredibly powerful departing point. But what we are seeing so far is that policy development has focused more on addressing drivers and risks than on facilitating human mobility. And Professor Colin will tell us more about this in a short while. We can also see that the transition from policy development to implementation has only just begun. So more than ever, we need examples and relevant instruments and practices that can provide useful models for inspiration or replication in other countries to address this gap. So our discussions today should lead us to highlight, on the one hand, the importance of safe, orderly and regular migration and the already existing good practices. Uh, it should help us also to provide insights on how we can ensure that regular migration pathways go a step beyond simply responding to crisis, but instead also serve to prevent crisis. And lastly, provide possible recommendations for states and other stakeholders to be integrated into preparedness and response plans. So I'm very happy now to turn to, um, to, our, to our speakers and introduce them. Uh, we will have Mr. Andres Perez Esquivel, who is the National Director of Migration uh, the government of Argentina. Then we will have the pleasure of listening to Professor Walter Collin, who is the envoy of the chair, a platform on disaster displacement, the PDD. Um, and then last but not least, and I see he is in the room, um, Mr. Andrew Harper, who is the special advisor on climate action at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR. So the, our three panelists will have 15 minutes. Um, and then we will be, I will be opening the floor for, I hope, 25 minutes for an interactive dialogue. And I count on all of you to, to, to be ready with your, with your questions and as well to be ready to uh, share your, your examples and good practices. Um, so first, I'd like to turn to, to Mr. Andres Perez Escobel. You have the floor for 15 minutes, sir. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, moderator. I hope you can hear me. First of all, I would like to, to thank uh, you for inviting the Republic of Argentina to this very important event that is dealing uh, with uh, the different overlapping crises and uh, which is of international concern and which does not spare any country from being impacted. At the level of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, it is rather alarming. According to the World, World of Food Program, um, there are more than 200 million people that go to bed hungry every night or do not have enough to eat uh, every day, and 11% uh, of these people live in Latin America and the Caribbean. According to the UN Office on Disaster Risk Reduction, in the last 20 years, the number of uh, disasters has doubled, and 90% of these disasters are linked to climate change. And according to UN information, in 2020, more than 30 million people were displaced because of climate disasters and this affected all continents but of course it affected countries that are most vulnerable according to uh, the world bank uh, in, uh, report it is estimated that there might be um, up to 17 million internally displaced people in latin america and the caribbean because of climate change so we see the adverse effects of climate change and this is one of the greatest humanitarian crises and challenges that we face in the 21st century. Now, 
In Argentina, we have a number of policies and initiatives to be able to rise uh, to these challenges, and we would like to mention what they are. First of all, we would like to say that uh, in terms of migration, Argentina focuses uh, on an open-door policy and um, a humanitarian approach. At the national uh, level, we are one of the countries that has ratified the largest number of international humanitarian uh, treaties as well as inter-American treaty. Migration and migrating is a uh, right. And in our law, we ensure that there are basic rights that are guaranteed. There is uh, an approach that is not uh, looking at immigration from uh, the uh, point of view of security. And uh, we have a large number of migrants that come from uh, the um, region. So we have 93% uh, no, of the nationals coming from our region can become Argentinian nationals. Uh, we know that we need to protect uh, IDPs as well as uh, protecting refugees, and this is applicable under international law. There is also international human rights law that is taken into consideration, as well as uh, the frameworks for um, international treaties, and these are all taken into consideration in our national policies. Uh, for example, our um, legislation on refugees, on migrants, uh, as well as taking into consideration the SDGs within our national policies. We always take into consideration as well inter-American treaties. In May this year, we launched a humanitarian aid program, and this is a specific um, program for displaced people because of uh, social or economic disasters. And the aim is to ensure that there is complementary international protection for displaced people that cannot be classified in accordance with international law as refugees. And we need to find sustainable solutions for how uh, we help them. So we have a Latin American focus, a sustainable focus, an environmental focus, and a participatory focus. The objective of this program is to ensure that people can stay uh, for three years. Uh, so those people that uh, have been affected by a social or um, environmental disasters. Uh, so after three years, uh, they can become permanent residents of the country. We also have in this program uh, insurance that uh, people can have access to basic uh, services. A civil society organization can also uh, request this specific type of visa that has been created. Uh, we are constantly working uh, in a participatory fashion uh, with uh, NGOs, civil society, as well as the Red Cross, so that we can ensure the sustainability of this program and so that we can uh, find uh, um, a lasting solution for the beneficiaries of this program. The focus is uh, on Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, not only because we are one of uh, the most affected regions, uh, if we look at uh, the natural disasters, um, we had uh, yeah, Hurricane Ian, uh, and in 2020, because of these uh, natural disasters, 20 million people were forced to display to uh, to move. And we requested uh, that Latin America and the Caribbean be recognised at the UN as being a particularly vulnerable region. Now, we know that uh, people who are on the move need uh, visas, uh, and that is why we have ensured that 
these visas are made available. This is an innovative policy for a number of regions. We have provided humanitarian visas because of natural disasters. So we had visas that were granted ex post uh, following an extraordinary event. However, we wanted a more preventive approach uh, and uh, we have worked with 23 states in uh, the region of Latin America and the Caribbean so that all people affected by natural disasters were covered. Uh, now, this includes uh, people that were internally displaced uh, or who were displaced across borders. Uh, now, this means that any person in any of these 23 states uh, that is part of the program will be covered. Uh, as I said, this is a participatory program uh, which ensures the sustainability of it. Uh, and we also have a community sponsorship program. And this was a uh, first in Latin America. This program was uh, presented by uh, the Director of Migration in Argentina and it was then uh, assessed by the General Assembly this year of the UN. And it was announced that this was the first commitment at global level that uh, was uh, presented by civil society organizations and countries in the region. This week, uh, we are also uh, launching a new regulation that is focused on South America, which deals with uh, short-term cross-border displacement caused by natural disasters. So this is what uh, we are looking at uh, when there are people who are affected by so um, um, natural disasters and who come to the Republic of Argentina. In other words, the countries um, coming from Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay. This means that uh, these people can come to Argentina even if they do not have the right documentation or if their, their uh, passports are no longer valid. So they, this is for displaced people who are not resident in Argentina. In this last uh, case, uh, people can stay up to three months, uh, after which uh, if the people's uh, re safe return can be guaranteed, they will return. Now, this is uh, an effort that is being uh, done together with uh, international organizations as well as national institutions. Uh, we know that uh, meteorological events uh, are the main cause of this displacement. 64% uh, of these displacements are caused by these um, climate events. Uh, and we know that geophysical events uh, represent 46% of uh, the reason why people are displaced. The policy has an advantage and uh, that is because it uh, contributes uh, to our uh, um, uh, statistics. We know that uh, when people are forced to move because of uh, natural disasters, uh, it is very hard to record the numbers. Uh, for example, if uh, people are forced to, to move because of drought, they are considered economic migrants. Uh, so what we see here is uh, we now have the ability to have a national registry and the statistics on this uh, linked to displacement. We have uh, an, an international efforts that are being made by uh, Mercosur as well as the American Conference on Migration. The uh, also uh, we are working with the, the platform on disaster risk reduction. The South American Conference on Migration was held under the presidency of Argentina in 2021, and it created a regional network on migration, uh, disasters, climate change, with the aim of uh, creating regional guidelines. This year, we have also approved a, a joint statement, uh, which will be given at COP27. Within uh, the uh, 
network on migration. Argentina also carried out a work a workshop on a cross border displacement caused by natural disasters. Now, this was a topic that was dealt with in the South American Migration Network, uh, as well as in other fora. We have also included a communique in the South American Network, uh, which will be which will present uh, the progress that has been made. Uh, We have also, since May, included the disaster risk platform, disaster risk reduction platform, and this has been done through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Currently, we have 18 countries from five different continents that are on the platform, and uh, that includes uh, the uh, European Union. So we are one of the countries that is leading the agenda on uh, forced displacement caused by uh, environmental factors. And uh, that is why it is a pleasure for me to be sharing uh, this panel with Professor Walter Kalin and the other colleagues. Uh, as uh, you can see from this brief summary, uh, we have shown a commitment uh, as uh, the Republic of uh, Argentina to deal with migration uh, and climate change, uh, and we do not want to leave anybody behind. We must shoulder our responsibility, but we also know that everybody is in a different situation, so we need to deal with this uh, in a sovereign way. And ensure that we avoid uh, humanitarian crises and ensure our societies are more resilient. Thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, Mr. perez Esquivel. That was um, really, really um, a compelling description of the commitment of your, of your government. Um, and I think you, you've done a fantastic job at describing the, the innovation in the practices that you have done, and the fact that it really has scaled, uh, given the fact that it, uh, it includes 22 countries. Uh, so this is a, a tremendously inspiring uh, practice that you have shared with us. And, um, and this is exactly what we were hoping to hear uh, in, this, uh, in this panel. Um, so I'm sure there will be many questions uh, directing, directed at you uh, as we move forward with, uh, with the questions and answers. But before we, we do that, um, I'd like to uh, now give the floor uh, to Professor Walter Quillin. Uh, so as I said, was the uh, envoy of the chair of the platform on disaster displacement that you have mentioned, Mr. Esquivel. Um, so we'll be really delighted to have uh, Mr. Quillin uh, talking to us about the PDD IOM baseline mapping results. Um, so over to you. Thank you uh, very much. and. Um... Good morning to uh, everyone. As we know, the relationship between food insecurity and migration is complex. I uh, will use the Global Compact on Migration as a point of reference and selected national laws, policies and strategies as illustrations. And in the following minutes, I'm going to highlight three aspects. First, uh, food insecurity as a driver of migration and displacement, and how it can be addressed, and to what extent our baseline mapping showed that this is being done. Second, regular migration as a pathway for people affected by food insecurity. And uh, third, a uh, few words on the protection of people forced to flee across borders in situations of acute food insecurity and famine. So, it is widely accepted, of course, uh, that the lack of food security is a driver of migration and uh, displacement. The uh, Global Compact on Migration addresses food insecurity. Professor, we lost you here in the, in the room. Professor? 
requirements do not compel people to seek a livelihood elsewhere through irregular migration. In this regard, states are called upon to use, among others, measures to reduce poverty and to increase food security, as well as measures to adapt to climate change and to reduce uh, disaster risks. In Niger, from where I presently speak, the 2021 Plan de Soutien aux Populations Vulnérables recognizes as a key driver of displacement the worsening of floods, the persistence of localized periods of drought, which are becoming increasingly unpredictable as a result of climate change, factors that further increase food insecurity and the fragility of ecosystems. The plan envisages several very concrete measures, including, for instance, social safety net programs that provide regular and predictable cash transfers directly to chronically poor and vulnerable households in order to reduce their persistent food insecurity. Such programs help preventing displacement by increasing the resilience of people at risk. Investments to reduce food insecurity are also important for internally displaced persons and refugees and their hosts during displacement, as well as in the context of durable solutions. Sri Lanka's 2016 National Policy on Durable Solutions for Conflict-Affected Displacement, for instance, calls for measures to enhance the capacity of host communities to accommodate IDPs, including, and I quote, support for expansion of economic and livelihood opportunities, food security, and environmental protection. IDPs are members of host communities who I recently met in the Sudan Central Darfur region, suggested to us that rather than continuing these food distributions, international actors should invest in water management measures that would allow to increase food production, not only for the local farmers, but also for the many IDPs in protracted displacement who had been able to rent plots of land or who were provi provided some land for free. As regards durable solutions, Somalia's 2019 national policy on refugee returnees and IDPs highlights that in the context of climate change, solutions in the rural areas require the agricultural and pastoral sector of Somalia to be revitalized and made more innovative, as these sectors are essential contributors to the country's national food security. And again, this national policy lists a series of very, very practical measures in this regard. These are just some examples of how states can address drivers of migration linked to environmental uh, factors or increase the resilience of people who already have been displaced within their country or find solutions for them. Overall, the baseline mapping on the implementation of commitments related to addressing human mobility challenges in disaster and climate change contexts, which uh, we launched uh, together with IOM and uh, other partners earlier this year. This baseline mapping found that in recent years, many countries have increased their legal and policy efforts to address environmental drivers. The mapping identified over 930 national policy and legal instruments in 171 countries, as well as 20 bilateral, 140 regional instruments in the areas of human mobility, of climate change, of disaster risk management, and of sustainable development uh, governance that contain provisions of relevance to human mobility in the context of climate change, disasters, environmental degradation. These instruments predominantly address such mobility from the prevention angle. They show that at legal and policy levels, we are actually making important progress regarding the commitment under GCM Objective 2 to minimize adverse environmental drivers that compel people to leave their country. But what remains to be done is robust implementation. And maybe there we are still not good enough 
at doing what needs to be done. Let me turn to the second aspect, regular migration pathways for people affected by food insecurity. In objective five of the GCM states commit to expanding and diversifying the availability of pathways for safe, orderly and regular migration, including in ways that respond to the needs of migrants in situations of vulnerability. And again, I think I have some interesting examples. I can mention examples that are relevant for our discussion. Nepal, for instance, has a long tradition of people from particularly food insecure regions migrating to India temporarily, particularly during the lean season before harvest. This means that less family members have to be fed back home, that the migrants can send at least some remittances back uh, home, allowing those remain, uh, staying there to buy additional food on the market. At the same time, reports indicate that migrants working in the informal sector may risk exploitation, while food production substantially declines in villages where only few men of able age remain. But this is an interesting example because migration from Nepal to India is regular. There is an open border between the two countries. And in this sense, this is a case of where two countries have agreed that uh, people can move freely across the border. There is growing recognition that bilateral or regional agreements on the free movement of persons have a huge potential to provide people anticipating or, have, um, or have being affected by disaster uh, related food insecurity with regular migration pathways. Free movement agreements clearly serve economic purposes. But in some parts of the world, for instance, in Africa's ECOWAS region, they have allowed drought affected people to find employment in neighboring countries. In the Caribbean in 2017, Trinidad and Tobago applied the Caribbean community CARICOM free movement agreements to assist Dominicans affected by Hurricane Maria. Other states in the region admitted people displaced by hurricanes on the basis of the free movement regime of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. In the Horn of Africa, IGAT, which was initially founded as a sub-regional organization to address drought, went a step further. It decided to formalize the availability of free movement or, uh, arrangements for disaster and climate change scenarios, when it recently finalized a draft protocol on free movement of persons. Article 16 of this draft protocol explicitly provides that people are moving in anticipation of, during or in the aftermath of drought and other disasters, that such people can enter the territory of another IDAT member state and stay there at least for some months. If they don't uh, possess a travel document required to cross the border, then this is not an obstacle because such disaster affected migrants will be registered instead. States of destination are also obliged according to the protocol to make, to take measures to facilitate the extension of stay and to facilitate access to other rights provided by the protocol. The protocol still needs to be adopted by the heads of state and government, but once this is done, it will provide a very interesting example that could inspire other regions too. Bilateral agreements on labor migration or quota for workers visa, for instance, uh, the case of agricultural workers from Pacific Island states who are employed seasonally in Australia and New Zealand. Such uh, agreements are another tool to provide pathways for regular migration for uh, people affected by adverse effects of climate change. Interestingly, the 2021 National Strategy on Internal Displacement Management of Bangladesh commits to facilitating temporary and circular international labor migration to diversify livelihoods of marginalized and vulnerable communities. And uh, it refers to the example of the temporary and circular labor migration scheme between Colombia and Spain, something that has already been applied in disaster contexts. 
Overall, however, the number of such examples remains limited. Not surprisingly, our baseline mapping found that unlike with regard to objective two, little progress was made in implementing objective five to expand migration pathways for vulnerable migrants, including those affected by climate and disaster related food insecurity. And this raises concern. As the International Panel on Climate Change recently highlighted, there are already areas and regions that are reaching the limits of adaptation to global warming. We must therefore increase efforts to prepare for a future where human mobility in disaster and climate change contexts will increase. And so we have to strengthen efforts to facilitate regular, safe and orderly migration in line with objective, objective five of the uh, GCM. Let me conclude with uh, some words on the protection of persons displaced across international borders. The limits of adaptation are clearly reached when people are forced simply to leave their homes and flee, be it to due to famine or other reasons linked to environmental factors. For such situations, the GCM under Objective 5 recommends to develop or build on existing national and regional practices for admission and stay of appropriate duration based on compassionate humanitarian or other considerations for migrants to compel to leave the countries of origin, for instance, by providing humanitarian visa, uh, temporary work uh, permits, while adaptation in or return to the country of origin is not possible. It also recommends to devise planned relocation and visa options for residency, where adaptation in or return to the country of origin will be impossible permanently due to adverse effects of climate change. As we just have heard from the excellent example uh, presented by uh, Argentina, such domestic laws already exist, and particularly in the Americas. There are many immigration laws provide that people affected by disasters may be admitted or allowed to stay temporarily for humanitarian reasons, as we already have heard. Uh, Guatemala, Mexico explicitly provide for humanitarian visa entry permits uh, for people affected by disasters. I don't need to repeat what we have heard about uh, the great new legislation and policies adopted by Argentina. And in fact, uh, most other countries in South America and Central America have a similar uh, legal uh, provision. And as Esquivel already has mentioned the guidelines adopted uh, in South America, Central American countries also have adopted a guide to affected practices to uh, admit uh, and allow for stay of people displaced across borders in disaster context. And finally, there are important developments in the area of human rights law. The Teichota case, in the Teichota case, the UN Human Rights Committee, the body monitoring the implementation of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, recognized that adverse effects of climate change may uh, lead to life-threatening living conditions in affected countries. The committee concluded that in such cases, deporting an individual to such a country might amount to a violation to the, of the right to life. Such life-threatening uh, conditions did not yet exist in the case of the citizens of Kiribati who opposed his deportation from New Zealand. But the implications of this decision are important. They are also important for people fleeing from countries where they would face famine uh, and other life-threatening effects of food insecurity. These developments are encouraging. However, there remain two somewhat isolated examples that have not yet reached the level of a global protection regime. In other words, much remains to be done to ensure that people displaced across borders can be confident of being welcomed, allowed to stay in their countries, regardless of their disasters and the negative impacts of climate change force them to leave their homes and seek protection abroad. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks, uh, Professor Quillin, uh, again, for another very rich uh, presentation. 
It was truly excellent to hear all the examples that you have provided, um, particularly in acknowledging that a lot of work is being done indeed by the international community, looking at addressing the drivers of migration. And I think it was really interesting to, to hear the point about the importance of not only working with the people that have been displaced, but very much also with the host communities. But you also acknowledged the fact that much remains to be done when it comes to providing legal pathways, uh, very much in line with this objective five that we were mentioning from the very beginning um, of, this, uh, of this session. So this is really a call for bringing this work at, uh, at scale um, and, and making sure that also we move from designing protocols and policies to actual implementation. And still a, a lot needs to, to happen on this front. So thank you very much again. Um, now I'd like to, to turn, last but not least, uh, to, to uh, Andrew Harper, uh, who is the Special Advisor on Climate Action at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. So Andrew, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecile, and um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's also a pleasure to come after Walter because he just knows so much about the issues um, at play at the moment. Um, and a lot of what I needed to say have, has already been said. So hopefully I'll be able to reduce my intervention to something which is um, less than uh, was anticipated so that there's more opportunity to have this dialogue, which I think is, is key. Um, I think in, in many aspects today is particularly timely because for those people who were observing um, the news last night, we had um, another cyclone come through the, the Bay of Bengal, and it just represents the ongoing tempo, increasing tempo of the frequent and intense um, disasters that are, are, are befalling so many parts of the world. And I'll take the, um, the opportunity to, to repeat the words of Samuel Hook uh, from the Centre for Climate Change, where he said, and many of you know him, um, we failed to avert climate change, we failed to minimise it, now we have to deal with it. And I think that the context of today's session when we're talking about food insecurity is very much that. Uh, what has taken place in the past does not necessarily bode well for the future. And we have to dramatically change the way in which we um, see the world and how we see our own responsibilities. I'm looking across at the member states that are here, many of them being impacted day by day, uh, whether it be, and I'm going to miss some, but um, uh, Egypt very much at the front and centre, and um, I, I should call, have a call out for Egypt. Oh, by the way, I'm not using my notes now. I've thrown those away. <laughs> um, Egypt has got a, a huge responsibility at the moment in order to draw the issues that are obviously at play, the issues which are becoming much more stark than what they were even in Glasgow um, last year. Uh, and I pay credit to Egypt because it is putting the issue of human mobility and displacement in the, in the, in the context of, of COP27 something which has been largely avoided in previous years. And so I hope that, well, I expect that many of the issues that have been raised over the next two days will be uh, very much front and centre when member states and others meet at um, Sharm El Sheikh um, just next month. Because what is occurring, what is occurring to countries, and I'm looking at Fiji, Ethiopia, Somalia, Philippines, um, Ecuador, Uganda, um, the Sahel, Northern Africa, Central, Central Americas, Southern Americas, um, the SIDS, um, even Europe, um, Chad, Burkina Faso, um, everyone is being impacted. And we have to be doing far more. And I hadn't heard the word about, um, no one's brought up the issue of loss and damage, but when we're talking about um, discussions about food and security, we also need to be looking at not just the promotion or the facilitation of migration pathways, which are obviously very key, but how do we also reduce the, um, the vulnerability of those communities who are being impacted so they don't have to move? 
and it's not putting in walls, it's not putting up barbed wire fences, it's not putting in draconian um, sort of laws and policies. We have to find ways in which we can uh, build the resilience of those populations which are being hit the hardest, and as has been repeated so often, who have generally got the least responsibility for the mess that the world is in at the moment. So now I'll sort of go into my, uh, into my presentation. Um, but also, firstly, th thank um, IOM for um, giving me the opportunity to, to be here today, because in, in the discussion about migration or whether it be displacement, it's just becoming so difficult to determine why people are moving in the first place. Is it because of food insecurity? Is it because of conflict? Is it because of forced recruitment, uh, poor governance? Uh, why are people moving from Somalia to Ethiopia, for instance? Why, why are people moving to Kenya? Uh, what, what's happening in Afghanistan? It's, we need to be much more sophisticated in our analysis and understanding of what the key drivers are. One of those is very much climate change, but in, in many aspects, it's exacerbating underlying challenges related to governance, uh, environmental degradation, um, inequalities. So, but thankfully, we are working in a much more collaborative manner and something which, uh, which I absolutely applaud. Um, in terms of the um, complex situations, and now I sort of go into my, my presentation, um, regular migration pathways, as well as other adaptation measures and resil resilience building of communities can be effective ways in preventing displacement from occurring the first, in the first place. But then I would reiterate that we're not even giving that a chance because there's no investments. It is like, I, I saw a stat yesterday saying that um, only 2% of global investments in renewable energies has been provided to Africa. What do we expect when, when, when that support is not being provided? We're not even giving the opportunity for people to adapt. We're only giving them the choice to move. Um, when adaptation strategies have failed or proved insufficient, people may be forced to flee from their homes. While most of them remain within their countries of residence, some, however, are forced to cross borders in search of safety and may be in need of international protection. And I'll, I'll just have an aside there as well, that in many aspects, it's those people who've got the resources and capacity and who may come from a certain socioeconomic background or nationality who've got the capability to move, who've got the capacity to move. We have to take into account those communities who are extremely vulnerable and focus on those as well the populations that are trapped, populations who do not have the capacity to move. Um, in, in, in 2020, UNHCR put out a legal considerations paper, and this is in the context of um, claims for international protection in, in relation to adverse effects of climate change and disasters. The relevance of international refugee and human rights law for the protection of people displaced across borders in the context of climate change and disasters, and hopefully clarify specific circumstances where international and regional instruments might be applicable. As a follow-up to the not to, as a follow-up to the 2020 legal considerations paper, UNHCR has also developed a roadmap for research engagement that aims to identify and analyse concrete situations where the adverse effects of climate change, environmental degradation or the impacts of disasters are considered to have seriously impact on a country's public order, potentially giving rise to the application of the OAU Convention. And for those people who, do, who don't um, know that, the OAU Convention um, provides refugee um, status or, or provides the opportunity for refugee status to be provided where the country um, has the in, does not have the capacity to provide um, response to a disaster. So this project will be implemented from the end of 19, from 2022 to 2024 in close collaboration with African institutional partners um, and other key stakeholders, including PDD. Um, eligibility to refugee status in this context might also include in particular situations where food insecurity, insecurity is linked to conflict and violence where, up, where government institutions may collapse or where vital services may be disrupted and famines ensue as a consequence. 
Temporary protection or stay arrangements may also be a pragmatic way to provide protection to those in need where no other legal option is applicable. States, as has been explained before, have committed to expand pathways for regular migration under objectives two and five of the GCM, including in the context of climate change and disasters. This was reiterated in the progress declaration adopted during, during the IMRF in May 2022. So despite the challenges, things are moving in the right way. And this is something which we have to, again, applaud and continue to drive forward. Um, however, and there's always a how, however, however, at this stage, pathways for regular migration, especially in the context of climate change and disasters, remain limited. This was apparent from the results of the regional reviews and the discussion during the IMRF. This is also one of the main findings of the study on human mobility and climate change in the IGAD region, a case study in the shared border regions of Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia, which is being finalised under the Migration Multi-Partner Trust Fund in the IGAD region, and something which Walter just mentioned before. A number of factors affect the ability of persons concerned to benefit from these pathways for regular migration, including, and I mentioned a couple before, but here's some more, the onerous requirements or application fees, the lack of documentation, the lack of information on the various steps and requirements, the timelines and evidence to be provided, the geographical distance from the authority in charge of the procedure, the lack of access to consular support, the lack of access to complaint mechanisms, and legal aid or effective appropriate remedies. So it's not, it's not just having the, 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 the legal pathways, it's also how do we make them applicable? How do we make them user-friendly? Uh, how do we make them in a way that they will actually be used if there's, if there's no real other choice? That being said, progress should be noted in a number of countries which established pathways for migrants or displaced persons unable to return due to climate change related events and disasters. Furthermore, at the regional level, freedom of movements arrangements are, are relevant instruments in the context of migration and displacement relating to climate change and disasters. In this regard, some provisions of the ECOWAS free movement arrangements have been implemented to facilitate entry and abolishing the visa requirements for a 90-day stay. Furthermore, and this is what Walter mentioned before, furthermore, the protocol on the, fr on the free movement of persons in the IGAD region, which was adopted by member states on the 24th of June 2021, recognises that disasters, climate change, and environmental degradation drive migration and displacement and could be alle alleviated through free movement. I think what, what I would like to emphasise here is that it's often those countries that are being impacted most by climate change, well, actually countries and regions that are being most impacted by climate change, that are actually doing the most to do something about it. And these are the countries and the regions that need support. It's the EGADs of the world, it's the SUDOCs of the world, it's the Argentinas of the world, it's the Ecuadors of the world, um, who are actually making substantive changes to their, their own policies, legislative uh, arrangements, and, but they can't be left to, to do this by themselves. They have to be provided with the support so that their own communities can adapt and continue to protect. Um, importantly, as highlighted above, I'll be wrapping up now. Importantly, as highlighted above, given that drivers involved in climate change, food insecurity and conflict are often closely intertwined, it is critical to ensure that all relevant frameworks and actors are coordinated to ensure a comprehensive response to the various forms of mobility in the context of climate change and disasters. Regarding these issues, the GCM, so the Global Compact on Migration, and the GCR, Global Compact on Refugees, should therefore be implemented in complementary manner, securing food security for host communities in the context of the GCR um, can contribute to reduce the migration drivers under objective two of the GCM. That was a mouthful. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Um, and thanks again to IOM for, for being so um, courteous for, for inviting us. Over. Yeah. Many, many thanks, uh, Andrew. Um, I, I really like the, the, the first line about the importance of implementing the GCM and the GCR in tandem and how much uh, the two uh, frameworks can really mutually reinforce each other. And that, that, was, uh, that was incredibly useful. And, and also um, cannot agree more with you about the fact that we, about the difficulty to, to determine why people move in the first place and how intertwined reasons are and how important that is for the international community and for governments to understand this complexity in order to come up with uh, the right 
solutions. And um, I very much noting as well that the, the focus that you put on the importance of you know, building resilience, reducing vulnerabilities, particularly for those populations that are trapped, that have no option, that cannot move. Uh, I think that was, uh, that was a very important key. Um, and finally, I think we also made a very important point about the fact that indeed we need to do much more in providing legal pathways, but we also need to make sure that those legal pathways where they exist are easily uh, accessible. So I think that was, uh, that was also very interesting to, to, to note this. Um, so I'm now going to open the floor for question and answers and very much uh, welcoming um, the, the participants online to put their, their, you know, to signal in the chat if they want to, to take the floor. But before we're going to uh, take the, the, the questions in the room in Geneva. And for that, uh, Dejan, uh, my colleague, is going to be um, taking over for, for, for that part. Dejan, over to you. Many thanks, Cecil. In this moment, we have the free request for intervention. And in following order, uh, Qatar, permanent representative ambassador who is here in the room with us, are following by representative Chad and followed by, by Morocco online. Uh, Qatar, Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sayyid al-Rais, al-Hadur al-Kiram, assalamu alaykum. Mr. Chad. First of all, I would like to say how pleased I am to be able to speak here, and I would like to thank everybody for their presentations. Climate change is one of the dangers that humanity is facing. It is a phenomenon that is having a particular impact on societies. The impact of uh, greenhouse gases and uh, climate change need to be taken into consideration, particularly when we look at uh, least developed countries and uh, developing countries, because those are the ones that are most affected by climate change. The impact of climate change affects people's livelihoods across the globe, and it also means that people are unable to meet their basic needs. Climate change also forces people to leave their countries and to go into exile. We need to take a national, regional, and international measures so that we can face these challenges. In line with this, Qatar is an effective partner, internationally speaking, because it is managing to face the challenges posed by climate change. We have an environment ministry which is constantly trying to take into consideration the challenges posed by climate change and all the questions that affect well-being. We have also established a national plan which focuses on um, renewable energy and this is how we will be able to take advantage of our natural resources. We also have an alliance amongst countries that face drought and Droughts have led to negative impacts and also has led to food insecurity. Through international efforts that we have also been able to provide assistance to countries that have been affected by climate change. $300 million have been given to uh, LDCs as well as developing countries by Qatar. Qatar has also supported rural communities in Somalia to achieve food security. $1.7 million have been provided and this has been done with the FAO. This um, will achieve food security 
we also have uh, 468,000 uh, people that uh, are being benefited by this project, particularly young women and uh, women. Finally, as uh, we gear up to COP27 next month, we hope that all countries will live up to their pledges and uh, their responsibilities so that uh, we can meet our greenhouse gas emissions targets and we also in need to ensure that we protect refugees and ensure that we have adequate financing provided to countries that face the impacts of climate change so that these countries uh, can uh, rise to the challenges of climate change. Um, Thank you, Qatar. Uh, next on our list is representative of Chad, who is also with us here in the room. I can't see it. Chad? Yeah. Please. Mesdames et messieurs. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and privilege for me to uh, take the floor during the second International Dialogue on Migration in 2022. And I would like to sincerely congratulate Mr. Antonio Vitorino, the uh, Director General of the International Organization for Migration, for the organization of this event on such an important subject. Indeed, this dialogue is a true opportunity allowing member states and observers and international organizations and other stakeholders to exchange uh, views and experiences in order to produce uh, specific actions on uh, food insecurity and climate change and my mobility and development. The level of participation shows the importance of the issue of uh, environment in migration under the goals of the Global Compact for Migration and uh, Chad is a champion country for this and it also shows our interest in the sustainable development goals. The link between migration, climate change and food insecurity is an unfortunate reality that we cannot ignore. Today, our country, Chad, is facing the harmful effects of climate change due to the rising of the waters of the Chari and Logonia rivers, which has affected uh, more than 166,965 uh, homes and has forced uh, people from 18 provinces out of the 23 to leave their homes. When these challenges uh, arise, uh, specific actions are brought together so that we can respond to the urgent. Uh, the government of the Republic of Chad uh, has ensured that under the drive of uh, General Mohamed Idris Debi, you know, President of Transition, President of the Republic and Head of State, and with the support of technical and financial partners, deploys enormous uh, resources to help the victims of uh, climate uh, disorders and uh, that's why we are launching a call to our partners to help us in fight these uh, floods. The implication of the highest authorities of Chad uh, show the how important the issue of environmental migration and its consequences have been uh, kept in mind uh, and that's why in 2021 the government of Chad authorized the International Organization for Migration in collaboration with the private uh, American University to lead uh, studies into the link between migration, climate change, uh, development and food insecurity in Chad. The results of these studies have uh, allowed decision makers with the, uh, within the framework of the nexus uh, between environmental migration development and food security. And I'm very pleased to recall that at the 26th uh, Conference of the Parties of uh, the UNFCC in COP26, which took place in Glasgow in 2021, we looked in particular at this subject of environmental migration. And this subject will also take a significant place in the discussions at COP27, which will be held in November 2022 in Egypt, and where Chad will take part. 
to conclude, I'd like to uh, really uh, highlight the relevance and quality of discussions that we had yesterday, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, next on our list is Morocco, who is online. Good morning from Rabat. Thank you for giving me the floor. Morocco is a country that is affected by uh, cross-border migration and climate change. And because of this, we have uh, an integration strategy for migrants. Uh, and we also have uh, a resilience, adaptation and prevention strategy to face uh, climate change. Uh, we have uh, different reasons for which uh, we are uh, uh, hosting migrants, for example, environmental factors, as well as the socio and economic uh, crises. Uh, it is important to state that uh, regardless of the reasons for which people migrate, uh, my Morocco has, uh, since 2013, a national asylum and migration policy uh, which has a clear focus on promoting human rights and this has a comprehensive, responsible and humanitarian and humanist approach to ensure the better management of migratory flows and to be able to host refugees and migrants better. As regards ensuring that migrants in irregular uh, situation received their documents. Thousands of people uh, since 2014 and 2016 and 2017 were uh, given regular status. Uh, we also ensure that social assistance, uh, housing, uh, vocational training, employment, uh, health care and education is accessible to refugees based on a policy of non-discrimination between migrants and uh, Moroccan citizens. Uh, the aim is to ensure that they are integrated and uh, that they have access to the same level of services as, my, as uh, Moroccans. Uh, now, it is difficult for us to deal with the consequences of climate change even though we have uh, tried to better understand the phenomena of human mobility caused by climate change. The impacts of climate change linked to uh, uh, environmental displacement, uh, the work that is being done by uh, the IOM and other international organizations, uh, uh, look at the fact uh, that adaptation to climate change uh, migration, strengthening the capacity of vulnerable countries are interlinked. And this means that the international community needs to work in this vein. We need to look at uh, the ability of uh, governments to be able to uh, deal with migrants who have been displaced by climate change. We need to look further into the reasons for their displacement. In line with this, we have launched a pilot project between migration, the environment and climate change, which is being considered. And this is a project that was proposed by the IOM. And this aims to support Morocco in its policies on climate change and the environment uh, through different studies so that we can see the impact of human mobility caused by climate change within the Kingdom of Morocco, as well as ensuring that people are trained on this subject. Uh, we have uh, had a regional symposium on health, uh, climate change and migration, and this has looked at the link between uh, climate change, health and migration in the region. And this has been done uh, through uh, presenting case studies, research, and looking at existing public policies on these matters. Uh, and we also looked at uh, what we could then have as contributions um, at the COP27 in Egypt. Uh, 
resulting from our symposium. Morocco is uh, following a comprehensive approach to fight uh, climate change, working with uh, international fora. We have a number of sectoral objectives for 2030 for climate change. As regards uh, renewable energy, Morocco has invested a lot in renewable energy. However, we do need the support uh, of the international communities and investors. Thank you. Thank you, Morocco. Uh, next on our list is El Salvador, who is with us here in the room. Buenos dias, excellence. Good afternoon, uh, Your Excellencies, Moderator, Panelist. We are grateful for the opportunity to participate at this session of the International Dialogue on, Dialogue on Migration. Uh, we think it's essential to look at priority subjects which help us to strengthen our work in migration. And I'd also like to congratulate the speakers for their very relevant interventions on what we have heard. As you are aware, El Salvador is considered a country of origin, transit, and destination in a vulnerable area to various natural disasters. In 2020, we had a tropical storm, Amanda, which caused to the loss of basic grains, in particular coffee and beans. And we were affected by Hurricane Julia recently, which led to floods and damages, which meant that we had to carry out multiple evacuations in our national territory. The intensity of this type of climatic catastrophe has led to impact on the economy, the agriculture and food security, and in particular, the negative effects of climate change affect men and women depending on the difference of access and control of natural resources, access to education, to information, to training and participation, and that has a significant impact on migration in the region. So the government of El Salvador has set up the development and well-being of people, and we've set up processes of transformation based on a welfare state which gives priority to the most vulnerable. and. We also include the gender perspective in all activities linked to adaptation, mitigation, and the implementation of humanitarian assistance. And that's why we've set up our humanitarian response plan, which looks at critical subjects linked to food security and nutrition, as well as actions to minimize the impact of climate and environment phenomena. One of the strategic axes is based on the response given to populations in situations of human mobility. So those who are internally displaced, uh, displaced asylum seekers, migrants and refugees who face uh, challenges in terms of protection in the context. Therefore, the results that are foreseen in the plan are focused on contributing to the reduction of food insecurity and the adverse effects of environmental factors and the reduction of uh, gastrointestinal illnesses in women and children, and we've maintained a strong link with human mobility. However, we consider it fundamental that on a global and regional level, we intensify the exchange of experiences and joint cooperation, both on a technical and financial level, between countries, international organizations, civil society, academia, the private sector, and the various interested parties in the development of strategies and policies that are sustainable to help us face the challenges brought about by the negative impact of climate change and food insecurity. Respecting human rights and humanitarian assistance in throughout the whole human mobility cycle. Thank you. Thank you, El Salvador. Next in our room is Colombia. And we have Colombia, Guatemala and Guyana. If you still have 10 minutes to go, I just ask you to be brief. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Good morning, dear colleagues and moderator for Colombia. It is uh, great to hear the experience of Argentina regarding the implementation of uh, the humanitarian visa for people from Latin America and the Caribbean who are affected by disasters. And we hope uh, that we will see more policies like this 
so that we can protect the people who are affected by climate change. Uh, Colombia has also focused on the regularization of migrants uh, through um, ensuring uh, the protection of the Venezuelans, uh, Venezuelan migrants, uh, which has covered millions of migrants from that country. We have policies um, to ensure that we protect uh, and uh, in, ensure that uh, the most vulnerable populations are um, covered. Uh, we know that uh, climate change has a devastating impact on food systems, uh, particularly impacting uh, children. Uh, we know that we need to adopt urgent measures to avoid hunger across the world, and we also need to change our food systems uh, so that we have uh, health, healthy and sustainable food systems for the future, including for migrants and the most vulnerable populations. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, say, as regards the policies that Argentina has uh, implemented, uh, that uh, there are those people who have been uh, given, uh, who've been given these uh, humanitarian visas, and we would like to thank Argentina for its efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our list is Guatemala. Guatemala, agradece a la organización. Guatemala would like to thank the organizers for this meeting and the panelists for their statements. States face challenges because of the structural causes of uh, migration and climate change is one of them. In countries that are highly vulnerable, such as Guatemala, the damage to life and the livelihoods of people in our region, and we see an influence in an increase in migratory flows. Food security linked to drought in the dry Central American corridor has left more than 3.5 million people in need of humanitarian assistance. And that's why we call for a world with a full respect of the environment, the protection of biodiversity and of ecosystems, as well as the need for an increase of efforts for adaptation and resilience. In Guatemala, climate vulnerability is due to its geographic position because we are between two oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic, and on the route of hurricanes and tropical storms. And we are subject to extreme events such as floods, droughts, and extreme temperature variation, which causes a loss of livelihoods and environmental services, which are essential for sustainable development. That is why it's essential for our country that we protect migrants and guarantee their fundamental rights throughout the migratory cycle. And we repeat the need to promote dialogue and coordinate a timely response which optimizes resources and we also need to generate cooperation mechanisms between states to ensure that we can manage in a comprehensive way the migration that comes about due to natural disaster and climate change consequences. The loss of ecosystems and diversity is essential. We need to have an exchange of good practices and to reduce vulnerability of populations. And that's why we must improve and strengthen national, regional, and global efforts. And we called on, inter on national institutions, the uh, diplomatic corps in Guatemala, civil society, and uh, United Nations system agency, so that we could work in a coordinated manner with the challenges in migration that we currently face. It is also essential for Guatemala to protect the rights of migrants and their families, and we must consider the positive impact they have on their countries of destination as well as their countries of origin. And that's why we must redouble our efforts and investments to work on strategies for adaptation and mitigation, and we need to build the resilience of communities affected, affected who need assistance with their livelihoods to ensure their well-being and that of their families. Thank you. Thank you, Guatemala. Next on our, on our list is Guyana online. Representative Guyana, please. Thank you very much, Chair. According to the IOM World Migration Report 2022, it is estimated that around 281 million international migrants in the world, and they are, in 2020. 
which equates to 3.6% of the global population. The link between migration and food security and climate change is complex, we, we all may agree. Migration can impact the food security and environmental conditions of receiving states, while at the same time accelerating environmental degradation has been shown to be push factors for migration or for migrants. As the global temperature rises, water resources will be disrupted, thus impacting food security and increasing irregular migration across borders. The World Food Summit 1996 defined food security as, and I quote, when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life, end quote. As an active participant in the process leading to the adoption of the Global Compact in Marrakesh four years ago, Guyana still firmly believes that safe, orderly, and regular migration is a major contributor to sustainable development and economic growth. Migrants can play a critical role in the economies of their receiving states and through the remittances they send back to their home countries. Multiple studies around the world have found that the remittances have an impact on the food consumption of receiving households. Further, considering the potential impacts of climate-related disasters, the FAO's report, the linkages between migration, agriculture, food security, and rural development, points to remittances as a form of insurance. An additional aspect of irregular migration pathways, sorry, of regular migration pathways, uh, and its impact on food security, is the role of seasonal migrant workers in the agricultural sector of developed countries. Circular migration schemes are critical to large-scale food production and thus to ensuring global food security. In many developed countries, agriculture is largely dependent on migrants to carry out seasonal work and to fill gaps not occupied by local workers. In the context of the CARICOM Agricultural Food Security Agenda, uh, on which His Excellency President Mohamed El Kanali uh, of Guyana. Uh, Guyana has made available lands to countries in the CARICOM sub-region for the development of agricultural projects. This action is ample testimony of the positive action Guyana has been taking to assist in global efforts to deal with the issues of climate change, food security, and migration. Guyana will continue to work with like-minded states and be involved in all global efforts, including the International Dialogue on Migration for the implementation of the Global Compact of Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to return back to Thor to Cecile to wrap up the session. Thank you. Many, many thanks and to, to all the, the, the member states that have uh, taken the floor. Uh, before we wrap up this session, we'd like to turn to, to our panelists um, just to see whether they would like to share some final consideration with, uh, with all of us. And I, I can see that uh, our, our colleague from, uh, from Argentina has his, uh, his hands up already. Um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Pérez Escrivel, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, muchas gracias. Uh, Thank you very much. I wanted to respond to the delegate from Colombia who asked a question of Argentina. The mechanism that we have for the work on food security is in conjunction with civil society. As I said, this program depends on a sponsor system from civil society where an organization asks for the entry permit for these people to come into a country and they provide maintenance and food, be it for a single person or for a family. So in this case, they will be covered for a year and there's follow up by state uh, bodies and from the very first day, these people are permitted to work without any obstacles. They have equal conditions with access to education and health, just as citizens of Argentina do. And currently, this is a very new 
policy. We're still working on it with various stakeholders, international organizations, uh, the Red Cross, uh, civil society. But we've opened a window now for people to open dialogue with the governments affected from the 23 countries. And should it be needed, there can be a referencing of cases to our country so that the program can start receiving uh, people affected by recent uh, natural phenomena and disasters in Honduras, Dominican Republic, uh, Guatemala, and so forth in recent weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Corinne. So um, I'm turning maybe now to uh, Professor uh, Quinning. Would you like to, to, to offer some final remarks on your side? Thank you very much. Um, I just would like to take up something the um, representative from uh, Morocco mentioned, the difficulties of uh, identification of uh, people uh, in context of um, climate change, because very often, and uh, Andrew Harper also mentioned that such movements are uh, multi-causal. I think one way to deal with that is really to look at the effects, and we are here talking about one effect, uh, food insecurity and famine. And that's the important uh, reason why people uh, need uh, protection, why they need uh, to be admitted to allow to stay in some cases. So rather than looking at the cause, we should look at the effects and then start uh, from uh, with the needs and the vulnerabilities of these people. Thank you. Many thanks. And now turning finally to uh, Andrew Harper. Thank you, Cecil. And, and I'll just go back to the current situation in, um, in Bangladesh, but you could also look at the Horn of Africa. You could look at um, Central America and South America um, and so many other places where the ability of communities to maintain their existing livelihoods um, and, and cultures is, is basically being threatened by the day. And it's food insecurity just doesn't happen because of food insecurity. There's a whole host of other reasons which we need to be looking at. And what I still see that's missing in everyone who's talking about often human mobility or migration displacement is sort of a more concentrated effort on not only the, the pathways, but how do we support the populations which are, are trapped or, or, or how do we stop them from being um, vulnerable? And I see our friends from, um, from the Red Cross movement here as well who have put out a good paper on what's blocking um, climate financing going to those communities which are most in need. And I, and I go back to the issue of that the people with the resources are risk adverse to helping those people who are most vulnerable. And until we turn that around and sort of, and the, 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 the title is um, of the um, ICRC ODI paper is embracing um, the uncomfortable or, or, dis, or the discomfort. And I think this is what we've got to be looking at. We've got to be seeing how can we support the adaptation? How do we support getting financing to where it's required? How do we support climate resilient infrastructure, uh, markets that will be fit for the future, not just um, for the current situation? How do we look at crops um, and agroforestry that will be fit for existing in Chad in 2030 or in, in other locations? Um, how do we ensure that the livelihoods for those farmers with small um, small farms in uh, Central America uh, can resist the, the growing impacts? How do we ensure that the, the national adaptation plans uh, have got investable, bankable projects that we can match with um, the IFIs? How do we stop the excuses for, for actually helping those people if we don't give them any choice? We'll have to move. Um, so th there's a lot of elements out there, um, and I think what what I hope COP27 will do is, is we'll bring even more attention um, to concrete examples of where we can make a difference. So we're talking about um, path migration pathways, but it's got to be one element of a much more comprehensive approach, um, whether it also be the issue of remittances, but what, what needs to be done at the international level, the regional level, the country level, the community level, um, and on that note, thank you. Many, many thanks, Andrew.
Um, so we, we have now reached uh, the point where we are concluding this uh, very rich um, discussion. I really want to thank all the member states that have taken the floor and shared uh, their, 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 their knowledge and uh, their practices with us. Particularly, it was uh, f fascinating to hear from the, from the government of Argentina about this very comprehensive way of uh, responding to the challenges at hand. But, um, but in, in general terms, I think we've, we've heard some very strong words uh, in, in, in view of the road ahead. And maybe that's on that that I'd like to, to conclude. Um, I think it's indeed very important that it was called by, by several participants to connect the conversation that we've had today with what's going to be discussed uh, at COP27 just in a few days. Um, so that all together, we, we are kind of joining those dots um, I can only echo what uh, Andrew was saying about the importance of um, connecting with uh, access to climate finance, making sure indeed that the most vulnerable population are part uh, of, uh, of the, the, the support, that they are put at the heart uh, of our efforts. Um, I think it's also very important to not uh, oppose what we're doing in terms of um, addressing the drivers uh, of the multiple drivers of migration and displacement with uh, the uh, aspect of creating uh, legal and safe pathways. They're obviously very complementary, but what we can observe is that for the time being, indeed, more efforts have been put on looking at drivers and not enough on creating the legal pathways that are also badly needed. So it's really having this balanced approach, uh, this balanced policy approach that is very much at the heart, I think, of the conversation that we've had today. And I think we really came up with uh, very rich uh, examples uh, as to how it can be done uh, within regional context. Um, and indeed, what is now a scale, is, and bringing this at scale, so making sure this is not a conversation that remains within regions that are the most uh, severely impacted, but that it becomes something that we can bring uh, as, as a solution for, for you know, globally, with, in solidarity with, with all countries, the ones severely affected and the ones that are less, uh, is very much the, the road ahead. So with these words, I'd like to uh, turn back to Dejan in the room, but a uh, very warm thanks from my side for what I think has been an extremely rich dialogue. Thank you. One more, one more time, thank you to all panelists and all, all who intervene uh, from the floor. And now we slowly transit into our next panel, where I will invite our colleague Manuel to come to take over the moderator's seat. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>